The following program is a speech given by Yuri Bezmanov, a.k.a. Thomas Schumann, a KGB disinformation officer who defected to the United States. The speech was delivered in Atlanta on March 14, 1985. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dick Backard, and on behalf of the Atlanta American Opinion Speakers Bureau, let me say we're glad you could be with us tonight. I will be your master of ceremonies for this evening's program. Before continuing the program, I'd like to depart briefly and let me address an issue of concern to many of us, and that is a vicious rumor circulating that conservatives, Birchers in particular, do not possess a sense of humor. Unfortunately, it's true. No, it is untrue. In an attempt to quash that vicious rumor, I'll tell a story that perhaps may be appropriate for this evening's speaker. It seems a Moscovite attempted to visit uh, the beer of the late Konstantin Chernyenko within the last several days and was turned away by a machine gun carrying guard who inquired of the visiting Moscovite, do you have a ticket to this event? And he said, comrade, I have a ticket for the whole series. I told that story to our speaker, Mr. Schumann, at lunch today, and I also commented after telling him, he laughed, by the way, and I asked him, perhaps Mr. Gorbachev would have a little longer tenure, and he looked over the top of his glasses and smirked and said, if he behaves himself. <laughs> I would like to uh, now call upon the Reverend Mark Luthold, pastor of the Northside Independent Methodist Church, to step to the podium to introduce our speaker. Our speaker has been personally involved with the worldwide propaganda efforts of the Soviet KGB. Like a true life Winston Smith from George Orwell's novel 1984, Thomas Schumann worked for the communist equivalent of Orwell's Ministry of Truth, the Novosti Press Agency. Novosti means news in Russian. It exists to produce slanted and false stories to plant in the Western media. The term for this KGB effort is disinformation. Mr. Schumann was born under the name of Yuri Bezmenov in Moscow in 1939, the son of a senior Red Army officer. Consequently, he went to good schools. At the age of 17, he entered the Institute of Oriental Languages of the Moscow State University. After graduating, he worked for Novosti, then out of the Soviet embassy in India in a department called Research and Counter Propaganda. Due to his growing disgust, he began to plan defection. In February of 1970, he disguised himself as a hippie. I've tried to picture that. <laughs> he had beads and a wig on, and I think that's maybe how he did it, and joined a tour group to escape detection. He contacted the United States Embassy, and after a long debriefing by U.S. intelligence, he was granted asylum and went to Canada. Today, he is a political analyst for the Panorama Weekly in Los Angeles. He is married and has two children, and he's the author of two books. Here to tell us how the communists used the free world press, will you please welcome with me Mr. Thomas Schumann. My dear American capitalists, or oppressed masses, whichever you consider yourself, I would like first, in the way of expanding my introduction, to show you several slides to introduce myself in a more pictorial way. That would explain you how a nice people like myself get into dirty business like KGB subversion. This is a small suburb of Moscow, a town which is called Mitishi, where I was born in 1939. You can see a typical decoration in any Soviet city, Comrade Lenin statue in the middle of the central square. In your mass media, in newspapers like New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Time Magazine, or whatever existed before, Comrade Lenin was described as the greatest humanist, revolutionary, and greatest politician. Recently, United Nations celebrated 100th anniversary since Comrade Lenin's birthday. Now try please to understand that in the eyes of people who walk by, you see these Russians walking by, Comrade Lenin was a short, bold man with speech impediment who died from syphilis and who introduced the system of mass terror and concentration camps in my country long before these beautiful ideas came to the mind of Adolf Hitler. You understand that Adolf Hitler killed six million Jews. Comrade Lenin established a system which killed 66 million of my countrymen. You understand the difference? And yet 
The government in Kremlin receives congratulation, congratulatory telegrams from United States officials, from your presidents and vice presidents, congratulating us with the birthday of our murderer. Try to imagine this. Partly it happens because of your mass media and your perception of my country. This is myself at the age of six or seven on the statue of another great politician, great humanist and peacemaker as New York Times described Comrade Stalin after the Second World War. Even at the age of six I realized that Comrade Stalin is not a great peacemaker and that I'm not living in a beautiful country of justice, equality and freedom and it doesn't take me a PhD in political science like some of you Americans have to study for six years to realize what socialism is. I understood it at the age of six when communist propaganda tried to explain to me that America is our enemy, that General Patton is just about in to invade our beautiful socialist country. My schoolmates were counting days and minutes. When? When General Patton is going to invade us? <laughs> we did not believe that United States is the enemy. We knew better at the age of six. When Soviet propaganda tried to convince us that CIA dropped the little Colorado bugs on our beautiful potato fields to eliminate our potato crops, and we were instructed to go to these fields and search for these beetles, and we couldn't find any, neither could we find too many potatoes, we realized that it is not America which is guilty of our failures. It is our stinking socialism which makes even potato rot in fields. When they tried to convince me that America is the enemy, on my table I had American-made spam meat, condensed milk and egg powders from the Lend-Lease Agreement. Now try to convince six-year-old child that all these delicious foods, which you probably don't appreciate these days, is supplied to me by the enemy. I didn't believe it. This is my father, inspector of land forces of Soviet army. He inspected Soviet troops stationed in such countries as Mongolia, China, Cuba, Czechoslovakia. He died in 1973. But his comrades right now, as we sit in this room, inspect Soviet troops, Soviet army, colonial army stationed in such countries as Cuba, Nicaragua, Yemen, Mozambique, Syria, Iraq, Zimbabwe, Ethiopia. You want more? There are more. Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Afghanistan, North Korea. You want more? Well, keep on sitting on your fat bottoms. There'll be more. Believe me. And your media, when they describe these countries, they refer to these countries as non-aligned countries, countries of the third world, or even some of your media comes with fancy names like liberated countries. In my country, sensible people call these countries betrayed countries, sold to communism, betrayed by your multinationals, by your banking systems, by your governments, by your politicians, and unfortunately I have to admit by you people, with your silent consent since my defection. Fifteen years later, more than 15 countries have been betrayed by you to communists. This is myself on the right with a naive, happy smile at the entrance to my college, Institute of Oriental Languages. I studied not only languages of India and Pakistan, Hindi and Urdu, but I also studied music of India, literature, philosophy, even religion, media, communication systems. I even tried to look like an Indian when I was second year old student and I succeeded as you see. And it was encouraged because that small elitist school was designed to train future Soviet diplomats, correspondents or spies. As every other Soviet student I had to volunteer, quote unquote, to harvest grain in Soviet collective farms, strictly according to the slogan, those who do not work shall not eat. You can see me eating, therefore I was working. And this is the area where Soviet students spend their vacation. It is called Kazakhstan. The picture I show it to you now is taken from an American magazine, U.S. News and World Report. I show it to you as an example of monumental idiocy of your mass media. They call Kazakhstan Russia's breadbasket. I hope some of you realize that Russia's breadbasket is not Kazakhstan. Russia's breadbasket is Texas, Kansas, Mississippi, Ohio. This is my first assignment to India as a translator with the Soviet Economical Aid Groups building oil refineries in India. At that time I realized already that what we were doing in India has nothing to do with cooperation, friendship. It has something to do with building carbon copy of Soviet socialism in India. The same socialism which we hated back home in USSR. But it was my country which sent me to India. My country, good or bad, I love my country and I still do. I may not like the system which was imposed on my country. 
My people sent me to India to be friendly to Indians, and I was friendly to little Indians like these boys, indecently exposing themselves, which is typical in tropical country. I was trying to be friendly to not so old Indians like this girl on the left. <laughs> I wanted to be a good Marxist, and if you remember, Karl Marx said, proletarians of all the countries, unite. So I wanted to unite with a nice proletarian. <laughs> this is the time when I realized first time on my own practical experience that it is not America which is a racist nation. It is my system which is a racist system. I wish I could explain it to Martin Luther King or Jesse Jackson. By Soviet law, Soviet citizen, Soviet bureaucrat like myself, is not allowed to marry a foreign girl, especially if she's of different or inferior quote-unquote racial origin. Many of your beautiful liberals, most of your intellectuals and mass media never explain to you people this very simple fact that racism exists in its pure form only in USSR. It is governmentally encouraged racism. I don't, of course, dispute that there are some bigots in your country who are pathologically unable to, to shake hands with blacks or red hair or whoever, or yellow or greens. But it doesn't mean that your nation is racist. You are the most harmonious country in the world. I know it. I am living now in black area of Los Angeles. I am married to a Filipino girl. I know what I'm talking about. By Soviet law, unwritten law, which is an instruction for every Soviet citizen who travels outside, a Soviet citizen is not allowed to marry a foreign girl, period. This you know for sure because you read your own newspapers. And this is what Time magazine writes about apartheid in South Africa. Black South African showing his passbook. And all the beautiful intellectuals and freedom fighting people in your country like Jane Fonda's and Schmonda's, they are very much indignated, you see. A worldwide outcry against repression. In front of African, uh, South African embassy, there is a demonstration every day. Why? because your beautiful intellectuals don't like apartheid. This African brother is showing his passbook, which it indicates his nationality, his picture, his race and color, and the rubber stamp by the police or the, by, by the government of South Africa, which prescribes him where he's supposed to live. For some strange reason, not a single beautiful intellectual of your country want to see my passport. And it shows here my nationality, if you can read Russian, it says here, Ruski right here and it has my picture and it has a police rubber stamp which prescribes me where I'm supposed to leave reside it is called propiska in Russian language police registration of residence fortunately I'm registered as Russian but if I were born a Jew from a small place like Zmerinka I have no business to live in Moscow Leningrad or Kiev and it's commonly known fact in my country Soviet citizen is not free to move even from one apartment to another, least of all to marry a foreign girl. And I was always crazy about foreign girls, I wanted to marry an oriental girl. It is very simple, not only because I'm a racist in the eyes of people like Jesse Jackson, but because I spent my childhood in oriental part of USSR, in Uzbekistan and in Kazakhstan. My father was fighting in the front line, my mother was working in a factory, and my first adopted mother was an oriental girl with dark skin and slanted eyes. That's where I learned first thing about love, tenderness. That was the lady which changed my diapers and wiped my nose. And for the rest of my life, as every normal human being does, I was looking for the same lady. I didn't want to marry a fat white Russian girl. I wanted to marry a, a, a nice <laughs> oriental slender dark girl. I could not do it because Communist Party has control and monopoly on my genes and chromosomes and I had to marry this nice Russian girl in the middle, I couldn't stand her. But this is the will of the superiors and it is very regular arrangement in USSR. A young bureaucrat like myself marries not his choice. My future wife has to go through security clearance. Without love, husband and wife become virtually informers on each other to prevent defection. And if you behave like a good boy, if you marry who, who they tell you to marry, this is what happens, a symbol of status of young bureaucrat in USSR. A government job, private car, which is not a big deal in your country, nice looking wife who reports everything you say to the KGB, and a transistor radio made in Japan to listen to Voice of America. <laughs> and again, if you behave, if you do what they tell you to do, 
you are promoted. You can see me on the right as a press officer of the USSR embassy translating a speech by a Soviet boss on the occasion of commissioning of this oil refinery in India. When the job was done, back I was in Moscow working for the Novosti Press Agency. This is the headquarters of Novosti in Pushkin Square in Moscow. Part of my job was to manipulate students of Patrice Lumumba Friendship University. This is a group of students, myself in the middle, visiting Kremlin. They don't look like students, and basically they were not. These are boys picked up from various countries of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, imported to USSR to be trained as future leaders of the so-called National Liberation Movement. When the training is done, they are being sent back to their own countries and start indiscriminately killing their own people. When they do that, your beautiful American newspapers describe these KGB trained bandits as, maybe you tell me how they describe them, freedom fighters, right? Anti-government guerrillas, leftist rebels, very polite names for these bandits. But imagine if Salvadorians start shooting back to protect whatever is left of their capitalism or whatever system they have, when they try to defend themselves against KGB trained bandits, what your media calls these Salvadorians? Huh? Right wing death squads. All right? Have you ever heard New York Times mentioning left wing death squads? No. Why not? Think about it. Please start thinking. You look like intelligent people. This is another type of my activity. You can see me on the left with a group of progressive intellectuals, writers, poets, jur journalists, editors, publishers of newspapers coming to my country, visiting Kremlin, seemingly for one purpose only, to denounce decadent, oppressive American imperialism and to glorify Soviet socialism. And of course, being paid for this. Secretly, KGB people like myself call them useful idiots. There is a group of idiots like that visiting Novosti Press Agency. I'm standing next to one of them. His name is Sumitranandan Pan, famous Indian poet who wrote a poem entitled Rhapsody to Lenin, where he described this murderer of my nation as, and I quote, springtime blossom for mankind. You can imagine how much money were paid to him. Pay attention to number of bottles on the table. My dear friends, this is hard booze, Soviet style. Part of my job was to keep foreigners, progressive intellectuals, your journalists, permanently on a certain level of intoxication, not too drunk, not too sober. Why? Simple. So that everything looks nice to them in USSR. The moment they step from the airplane in Moscow airport, we take them to VIP lounge and we toss champagne to friendship, understanding, peace, freeze, schmiz, and if they refuse to drink, we tell them, look, this is unethical, Comrade Andropov may be offended, or Gorbachev. It's a tradition in my country to drink. And poor idiots start boozing, two, three, four, five days, ten days, and then suddenly we stop. And if any one of you will ever try to drink for five days and then stop, you know what will happen next morning? What will happen next morning? I'll tell you what will happen. You'll be sick next morning. You'll have hangover. You may feel uneasy and guilty trying to remember what you were talking about yesterday and with whom you slept last night. This is the time which, according to KGB experts, when human psychology and mentality is the most flexible. Not only alcohol does it, drugs do too, many other things, but alcohol is the most innocent thing. In USA, it is not a big problem. You cross the street by yourself six-pack of cold beer and refresh your memory. In my country, I control these idiots. I take them to a motel and there is not a drop of alcohol miles around, and they are dying for a drink. This is the time when we get them involved in all sorts of KGB propaganda operations, such as making statement in the interest of Soviet policy, signing joint communique, or if they are politicians, signing SALT agreement, Helsinki Accord, preferential trade treaty, anything at all. Believe me, not only journalists are doing that. If you remember Pierre Elliott Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada in Havana in 1975, when in front of the thousands of Cubans he shouted, Viva Presidente Castro! At the time when hundreds of Cuban mercenaries were killing thousands of black brothers in Angola on Soviet orders. Well, if Prime Minister can do that idiocy, what do you expect from Walter Cronkite or Dan Rothers or some other, I don't want to use strong words, who come to my country. This is what happens. This is one of such soberly thinking politicians, as your media calls them. A picture is taken from Time magazine. 
And they describe in rhapsodic terms how this beautiful intellectual dances with the Moscow bride in Moscow wedding palace. What you don't understand, that he may think that he is a great politician, charismatic leader who found a common language with the Russians. Look at the faces of KGB behind him. They think he's a total idiot. He does not realize that this is not just an ordinary wedding, it is a special occurrence, a stage performance to impress people like uh, Edward Kennedy. I can forgive 11 year old little monkey like Samantha Smith, uh, your girl who comes to Russia on invitation of Comrade Andropov, she comes back and she says, look, Russians are just like us, they're nice people. Sure we are nice, we have two hands, we have one head, we go to bathrooms just the way you people do, we make love, we make babies too, we love them. She may not know the difference between the systems, and I can forgive Samantha Smith, she's only 11 years old, but I cannot forgive a political prostitute like Edward Kennedy. <laughs> just to show you what happens on occasions like this, if you think I'm just pulling your legs or other parts of your anatomy, believe me, Edward Kennedy is not taking part in a regular Soviet wedding. This is what I was doing as a Novosti Press agency agent. This is myself. On the left probably is the same bride, or maybe different, and three impressed journalists. Just exactly like Edward Kennedy, they are very happy to see regular Soviet or Russian wedding. It is not regular. You understand, I hope, what I'm talking about. This is another type of activity. I'm on the background under the red spot with a group of writers, journalists from developing countries of Asia, Africa, and Latin America visiting regular kindergarten. They don't realize it is not an ordinary regular kindergarten. It is a special kindergarten, even though by American standards there is nothing special. But in the Soviet Union, it is specially organized to impress foreign journalists. The ordinary one looks like this in the middle. It was published by mistake in a Canadian government publication and the caption says that this is a regular daycare center in Siberia. What these dimwits didn't realize, it is not a daycare center, it is a prison for children of political prisoners. Of course we don't want to sh to you to see these things like that. We want you to see pictures like this, that's what my job. And my job was to isolate your media from pictures like that. This is myself with a copy of Look magazine. In 1966-67, I was attached by the KGB to a group of Americans who visited my country. They spent their one year, 12 of them, to bring you back that package of what they call information. Millions of Americans looked through this magazine. They didn't realize that the big shrieking lie is right here on the front cover of this magazine. This morning I was talking to a lady from a local newspaper. And she couldn't see it. she couldn't see the lie, she couldn't tell me. And she is a journalist. Maybe some of you tell me what is the lie? Where is the the lie on the on the front cover of Look magazine? No, modern building is just a photograph. I prearranged this photograph for Philip Harrington, photographer of Look magazine. Fifty years. And this is no no you just illustrate my point. You don't know where the lie is because you are victims of disinformation. The biggest, fattest lie is right there, Russia. There is no such country, my dear friends. Russians are ethnic minority in a multiracial country. There is no Russian government. First of all, there is no government period. Government does not govern in USSR. Power does not belong to the government. Power in USSR belongs to a bunch of self-imposed criminals who call themselves Politburo, top of the Communist Party. And they are not all Russians. Comrade Stalin was Georgian, Comrade Mikoyan was Armenian, Comrade Khrushchev was Ukrainian, Trotsky and Sverdlov were Jewish, Pelche was uh, Estonian, Comrade Kusinen was Finn, and there are many other ethnic representatives in Poland. Of course there are Russians too. There is no Russian army, there is no Russian invasion in Afghanistan, there is a communist army and a communist invasion in Afghanistan. Russians are not coming to your country, communists may come to your country, and it will not be brought to you people by Russian tanks. Use your brains, please. If Russian or Soviet army invades your country, do you know what will happen to that army? Think. Right. They will disappear in your liquor stores. <laughs> now, please try to understand that this is not a semantic slip of tongue. It's not an inaccuracy. Russia and Soviet Union are not interchangeable words. Why do you think your journalists for many years try to convince you that what you are dealing with is Russia? Why? 
simple, it's the trick, it's the result of Soviet propaganda, which is as old as mankind itself. We try to scare you with non-existent threat, Russians. Russians are peaceful people, probably the most peaceful on earth. We are fed up with war, we've been fighting for more than a thousand years. We are sick and tired of wars, but we are forced to go to war by the same bunch of megalomaniacs in Kremlin who receive billions of dollars of your taxpayers' money and your credits and your technology and computers. Do you understand the difference between self-imposed dictatorship and my nation? Or you don't? Well, it's high time you should understand it. Russians are no threat to you. This is a trick to scare you with Russians. Meanwhile, you don't notice that the main danger comes closer and closer to your doorstep. And that danger is not coming from Russians. It comes from the system of one big government. Socialism, fascism, Nazism, totalitarianism, whatever it is however you describe it. This is the result of my work. I've been working with the dim wits of your mass media. There they are, the whole group of Americans in Stalingrad, including Philip Harrington, look photographer. On the background you can see the statue of Mother Russia, big oversized lady with overdose of hormone. <laughs> this is the area. It is about 10 times bigger than Statue of Liberty in New York City. And this place is constructed by Communist Party propaganda for indoctrination purposes. You can see this picture from the Soviet media. Soldiers are pronouncing the Pledge of Allegiance to the Communist Party under the statue of Mother Russia, right? And yet the same picture was published in Luke magazine in the centerfold and the article which follows describes that every Russian is very proud to see this monument. Do you understand what they are doing and what they are saying to you? Could you find me one American Vietnam War veteran who is proud to see monument in Washington DC with names of thousands of your boys who were killed in Vietnam for nothing, for peace with honor, as Dr. Kissinger calls it. Could you find me one veteran of Vietnam who is proud of that? What do they feel, these American boys who survived that massacre? What do they feel? They feel sad, they feel sorry, they feel disgusted and betrayed. They were sent there for 12 years and they were not allowed to win that war. When they come back, people like Jane Fonda spat in their face. How do they feel? Please explain me. Proud? Now why do you think that my nation is so dumb to feel proud when they look at the, at the idiocy like that? We feel the same way. We feel sad, we feel sorry, we feel disgusted. We feel betrayed because we lost 20 million of my fathers, mothers, sisters and brothers in a war which brought us nothing, which brought restoration of Stalin's power, more blood, more death, more concentration camps to my nation. We don't feel proud at all. Look magazine lies to you, same way as many other papers today, right now, lie to you about the Russians. After several successful operations like Look Magazine, I was transferred back to the Soviet Embassy in India. You can see me on the right with the microphone. On the left side, Indira Gandhi, Prime Minister of India, talking to my KGB supervisor, who incidentally now in your country. His name is Leonid Mitrokhin. He's in New York City working for United Nations. He's a high-ranking KGB expert. Why would you think a Prime Minister of a free independent country, biggest democracy in Asia, talks to KGB persons? The trick is that A, India never was biggest democracy in Asia. Your newspapers lie to you. India was biggest autocracy in Asia. It was ruled by Nehru's family. First Jawaharlal, then his daughter Indira, and now her son. Second, Indira Gandhi is not a non-aligned leader. It is not a neutral country. Indira Gandhi was in the Soviet pocket from the first moment she stepped into her office. Indira Gandhi didn't do anything without coordinating her decisions with the Soviet Embassy, with us. When she came to your country two years ago, she lied to you and your media repeated these lies that there is no, not a trace, no evidence of Soviet military presence in India. Believe me, I was de dealing with the Soviet military in India. Some of them were preparing Indian seaports for Soviet nuclear submarines. Others were preparing invasion into East Pakistan which the dim wits of your mass media describe to you people as the grassroot Islamic revolution in Bangladesh. And believe me, there was no grass, no root, no revolution, and least of all Islam. Islam is a religion, it has nothing to do with revolutions. Ayatollah has nothing to do with Islam. 
your embassy was not blown up by Islamic terrorists. It, it was blown by terrorists, yes. But they are not Islamic simply because they were born in Islamic country. Do you understand the difference? Your media does not. This is another type of KGB activity. You can see me on the left, my supervisor, Leonid Mitrokhin, on the right, in the middle, professor of political science, Delhi University. Why do you think KGB socialized with professor? What kind of secrets we can learn from the professor? We are not after secrets at all. We are after public opinion of his country, of the future generation of his students. We invite this professor to a meeting of in the Soviet society, there he sits in the middle, same society exists in USA, it's called American Soviet Friendship Society. It's the front of the KGB. There's the professor sitting in the middle, marked by the red pencil. You can see me on the right in the lower corner, sitting next to Indian politicians and members of parliament who were brought to this meeting to create atmosphere of legitimacy and even respectability to Soviet propaganda operation. Just for one professor, we can stage the whole farce like this. Why? Simple. Because this professor will be sent to USSR, indoctrinated, pleased with presents and, and probably paid Lenin's peace prize. And then he comes back and for many years, he will pollute minds of millions of children with advantages of socialist system and disadvantages of American imperialism. And I will explain you later what it does to a country. These are the people who arrange this propaganda operations of the KGB. No, they are not spies, but they work for the KGB. Entire department of the USSR embassy in India, including myself on the left and this gentleman on the right, whose name is Vladimir Simonov. Each time your journalist asks me, Mr. Schumann, how many KGB agents work for the Soviet embassy in Washington, D.C.? I think it's a very dumb question. All of them are. Their wives work for the KGB, sometimes even their children. The solution is not to find who exactly works and in which rank. But the solution for your country, for your security, is to kick out all of them. <laughs> Unless they behave, of course. If they behave like normal people, fine. But they don't. That's the trick. They should be kicked out together with their beautiful United Nations. <laughs> now, these guys, including this gentleman, Vladimir Simonov, you should remember his face. Maybe there's a chance you can see him on ABC Nightline together with Ted Koppel, like my former friend and colleague Vladimir Posner, who appears on your television. He addresses to millions of American television uh, listeners, and he introduced by Ted Koppel of ABC as, I quote, Soviet commentator, Soviet journalist Vladimir Posner. Believe me, he's not a journalist. He is a high-ranking expert of subversion. I worked together with him for many years in, in the Novosti Press Agency. The fair way to introduce him would be, he is an expert of manipulating public opinion. All right, Comrade Posner, now what do you have to say? No, Ted Koppel says, Volodya, what do you think about Korean airliner incident? What can Volodya think? He is not paid to think. He is paid to screw up your minds with lies. There is another Volodya, Vladimir Simonov. He sits in New York City. He works against the security and interests of your country. FBI knows perfectly well that he is not a journalist. FBI knows that he is a KGB officer. But you see, FBI cannot kick him out of United States. Why? Because he doesn't do anything against the law. There is no law against political prostitution in your mass media. Vladimir Posner easily socializes with your Cronkites and Dan Rathers and Ted Koppels. He gives them, he plants false stories in your media to depict your country in the worst possible terms. And yet he's here. But there is a law, believe me, if you think I'm crazy, go to library and check. There is a law in your criminal code which forbids your FBI from contacting your own media or using your journalists in any possible way in their operations, secret or overt operations, against bandits like Vladimir Simonov. Now please try to explain me, maybe I'm a dumb Russian, who is more dangerous for you people, my KGB or your FBI? Are you a free and proud nation, or are you a nation of masochists? Why do you pay your taxpayers' money for Soviet espionage in your country? Why do you keep United Nations in New York City? Each time you ask me, Mr. Schuman, if Russians don't like communists, why don't they revolt? Well, let me ask you people, why don't you revolt? <laughs> There's another type of activity of the KGB, nothing to do with espionage. You can see in the middle, a famous Indian guru, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, Transcendental Meditation. On the left is myself with a beautiful Walter Mondale smile. 
Now why? Please try to understand. Why? Why would KGB send me to Maharishi? Of course not to learn secrets. He has no secrets. It is the public opinion that KGB cares about. We know perfectly well what Maharishi did to the Beatles. You remember the four degenerate monkeys? I want to hold your head. How does it feel? A son of high-ranking military officer, a promising diplomat, highly paid bureaucrat and expert in propaganda, 15 years later after his defection, changing bulbs and flushing toilets in, in Los Angeles. How would you feel? Would you like to take my place? Oh, no. Another reason to think twice is this secret document. This is what prevents many Soviets to defect. It is called Charakteristika in Russian language, or simply recommendation letter. Every Soviet agent who is assigned to a foreign country has to be co-sponsored by three long-standing members of Communist Party. If I defect, all three of them will be fired, imprisoned, or executed. Two of them my friends. This is why I feel worried before, I think twice, twice before defecting. I don't want to endanger their lives. Unlike your Dr. Kissinger, who signed death sentence to half of Asia, and he feels okay. He sleeps well, he eats good, his stool is regular, no problem. But I would feel guilty. I could not live as a normal being as if I knew that this guy suffered because of my defection. Besides, you never know. Maybe they will come to power. Maybe they will be better negotiators with your George Schultz. Maybe they will be able to stop the madness of nuclear confrontation. Even if there is one in a million chances, I must not endanger their lives. This is one of the reasons why there are not that many defectors from positions like mine. Who defects to your country? Sailors, dancers, you know, the entertainers, but not KGB agents. If you treat us like you treat me, I'm sorry, not, not too many agents will defect to your side. And yet there is another reason, my family. Even though it was a marriage of convenience, by mistake we made a baby. So what can we do? It's immoral to leave your wife and child behind. Even in the United States, if you have no political reasons to leave your wife, if you have no sensational message to your CIA, it is simply dirty to leave your wife and child behind. In my case, I could not take them with me. Why? Because Indian government, which this media is a neutral government, betrays defectors to the Soviet KGB. After this lady defected in India, and she's Stalin's daughter, if you remember, she defected in 67 three years before my defection. Soviet embassy was so mad at the Indian government that we forced, Soviet embassy forced Indira Gandhi to adopt a law which says, and I quote, no defector from any country has a right of political asylum in any embassy on territory of India, which as you may understand is the highest degree of hypocrisy because only Soviet defector needs a political asylum. Imagine yourself an American citizen in India and you want to defect to USSR. Do you need a political asylum? I suggest psychiatric asylum. <laughs> in my case, it was virtually impossible to defect normal way. And I found that my own crazy way. I noticed that there are many American hippies in India, like the one on the left. No shoes, long hair, smoking hashish. I talked to them, I studied their way of life, their counterculture, what they smoke, where they congregate. Then I decided that with my pale European face, if I run away from the embassy, the police will catch me in five minutes. But if I dress like the hippie, a crazy Russian in a, cra in a crowd of crazy Americans, it's very difficult to find. This is what I did. I dressed as a hippie, I joined them, and I disappeared. All the papers reported about my disappearance. Most of the Indian papers carried my picture, description, and promise of 2,000 rupees. There, you see in the middle of the text, under the picture. 2,000 rupees for information leading to my arrest, as if I was a criminal or a murderer, and it was an insult biggest insult in my life. I thought that my head worth more than 2,000 rupees. <laughs> they could not find me for very simple reason. They were looking for this gentleman, and at the time of defection I looked like this, obviously. Not a single sensible detective would ever suspect that a normal Russian diplomat would look like a total idiot. <laughs> this is probably what saved my life, and another factor was American CIA. They smuggled me out of Bombay airport, after I contacted them, they brought me to Greece, they debriefed me for six months, they changed my name to that of Thomas Schumann to protect my friends and relatives, to keep me away from mischief and the KGB. And it took KGB five years to find me in Canada. This is another proof to you that KGB is not a super smart or super effective agency. It's a huge bureaucracy of bumbling idiots. Their right hand doesn't know what their left hand is doing. They are effective in your country, not because they are smart, 
but because there is no resistance. Because people like American Union of Civil Liberties prevent your FBI and your police from protecting you people against KGB. This is why they affect. And because there are groups and elites in your country who don't mind KGB at all. They are very paranoid about CIA. Your media is very paranoid about CIA. They don't mind KGB at all. Beautiful people like Bella Abzug are very mad when FBI keeps a file on them. For some strange reason, Bella Abzug doesn't mind KGB keeping file on her. Strange, isn't it? If you have a chance to ask Bella Abzug, ask her on my behalf why she is so peaceful and uh, complacent about KGB keeping files on Bella Abzug. Well, this is basically my life story and my activity, which is described quite accurately in this book by John Barron, KGB Today. This is the first time in the United States when an American writer eventually, after 67 years, discovered that espionage is not the main danger to your people. The main danger, which is described in KGB language as active measures. This is the business I was in for 12 years. And I'm going to explain you the specifics, and I'm going to show you some examples of that. Probably by the end of this lecture, if you are still awake, we'll try to figure out how to recognize this and what to do about it. If you want to stay free and proud nation and a superpower and the hope for all mankind, what to do about this dirty business? You can put on the lights, I'm going to show you something more interesting. Each time I'm talking to your journalists, they ask me, Mr. Schumann, give us one specific evidence, you know, one example, how KGB infiltrates our media. I don't know what they expect from me, fingerprints or receipts. I undersigned, then rather, received million dollars from Comrade Andropov for lying to Americans. There are no such receipts. Besides, Dan Rather doesn't need any money from KGB. He's filthy rich himself. We are not talking about something that will stand up in your court simply because your laws are very soft and appeasing to your enemies. There is one overall law in your country. Aiding the enemy is a high treason. But many people in your country do that. Henry Kissinger does for the last 12 years or more. So does Occidental Petroleum, Armand Hammer. So does Ford Company. So does Trilateral Commission and Council on Foreign Relations. And yet they are normal, respected citizens. So where is the focus? Where is the sensitive point? How? Where is the division line between sanity and insanity? Between security of your nation and the unlimited subversion of your country? How to recognize it? Believe me, you don't need experts. I mean, you need experts, but not the type of experts which are stuffing your Harvard and Yale and Rand Corporation on the think tanks, I'd rather call them stink tanks. Just try to think, maybe let's think together. For 60 years, you have intellectuals who spend millions of dollars of taxpayers' money to research Soviet Union and communist system. They are still respected citizens like Comrade Brzezinski and uh, Mr. Arnold Horelik. They are on payroll of your government, that means you, all right? For 60 years, you had failures, one after another. These beautiful researchers give advices to your government, to your Pentagon, right? They navigate your policies. This morning I saw Edward Litwak on your television, on Phil Donahue's show. He is one of the greatest experts in the Center for Strategic Studies or something in Washington, D.C., right? These people receive hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And yet for 60 years or more, They've been given advices to your government, which eventually led to what you are now. You are up to here in manure. And I'm not talking about nation, I'm talking about your foreign policy. You lost your friends and markets in Asia, Africa and Latin America. You antagonized your neighbors next door in Mexico. You cannot find common language with Canadians. You cannot even settle your own domestic problems with your blacks, Hispanics and, and Chinese or whoever else lives in your country. You have people who chronically complain about oppressive capitalism and yet they demand welfare check from your government which has nothing to do with capitalism, it has something to do with socialism. How? All these beautiful intellectuals receiving so much money cannot find a better solution. Common sense tells us people that if something doesn't work, you throw it to garbage and try something else. Why for 68 years you repeat the same mistake over and over and over again? Is it not time to turn and try something else? Right? Now let's see. Let us see the examples. 
they may look innocent to you people. I will try to explain you that it is not innocent at all. It may not look sinister from the first glance on this. What I was doing for the KGB has nothing to do with espionage. Your Hollywood gives you all kind of baloney, you know, this James Bond espionage, bang, bang, kiss, kiss, you know, you get excited about spies. Meanwhile, the main danger doesn't come from espionage at all. KGB spend only 10 to 15 percent on espionage, the classical James Bond espionage. The other 80 percent is spent on subversion. I cannot possibly exp explain you in one hour all that garbage which took KGB six years to put into my head. It took your CIA six months to debrief me. I cannot squeeze it all in one hour, but I'll try to just give you basics. And of course, if you are not satisfied, there is literature on the table. I'll show you what it is. First of all, there is a booklet, which I published myself because your publishers doesn't want to publish my, my book. So I did it myself. It's called Love Letter to America. That's the way I feel. And that's the way millions of people feel in my country. Believe you, we are as a nation, not your enemies. Our common enemy is sitting in Kremlin and probably in some offices in Washington, D.C. These are the same dim wits who send your boys to Vietnam for 10 years or 12 years to die for nothing and finally you give this country to the enemy. These are the same idiots or traitors who send your boys to Lebanon, put them all 400 men in the same building to be blown up by terrorists. These are the same idiots and traitors who send four helicopters to rescue your diplomats from Tehran and the helicopters were crushing in desert. The same traitors who now send Henry Kissinger to Latin America to save Latin Americans. God save Latin Americans from such saviors. I describe this process in that booklet, Love Letter to America. It's a small book. I ask $5. I know it's a highway robbery, but I simply must charge you $5 because I have to compete with Jane Fonda's and Schmonda's. Rockefeller Foundation does not support my lecturing tours. This is another paperback which is published in your country by two clever journalists who finally realize that American mass media is being manipulated by the KGB. It's a novel, it's a fictionalized story written by Robert Moss and Arnaud de Boschgrave. One of them worked in Vietnam for Newsweek magazine. They only changed names and dates and places to avoid legal problems like General Westmoreland had with your CBS. Otherwise it's a so accurate description of what exactly I was doing for many years that I can't even recognize my former colleagues. Both of these books, I think, is, is the minimum that you should read to understand what I'm talking about tonight. If you are stingy, you don't have five dollars, have both of them for five bucks. And then finally, for some of you who are more interested in specifics, I especially recommend it for mass media. This is a description of exactly what services your journalists render to, to the KGB. It is called World Thought Police. It is a description of Novosti Press Agency, structure, functions, and simply list of services which your media renders to, to your enemy. How to recognize it, what to do about it. These are two things that I offer you, or rather three things. Each of them. Oh yes, if reading is not your cup of tea, I realize in the United States people don't read much, there's a tape in English for the same price. All right, now let's try to see the example. Let's listen carefully. It works! ponderously, fitfully, unevenly, but 50 years after the revolution that changed the world forever, the system is foistered with weasels and, and life. It bubbles with life. Hmm? Life! The system which killed quarter of its own people, 66 million, is bubbling with life, according to Look magazine. Do you understand? Not too many Americans realize what they are reading. Here, another paragraph. If an honest democratic election were held in the Soviet Union today, Communist Party would win. Do you understand what they are writing to you? How many parties are in USSR? One. Okay. Make a wild guess. Which party would win if there is a free election? <laughs> it's a logical nonsense. Even if there were more parties than one, Communist Party will never be elected in my country for very simple reason. We are not that dumb. We may look dumb if we drink too much vodka, but believe me, my people are not that crazy to vote their own murderers to power. Instead, we'll take them to court, like Nazis were taken after the Second World War. We charge them with mass murder and we will execute them. And they know it perfectly well. That's why there were never free elections in my country and to that matter to in any other country of the world. Not a single communist on this planet ever came to power as a result of free election. They always come to power through deceit and lie and 
terror, shooting and lying, lying and shooting. That's how they come to power. To support obvious lie, they give you all that baloney. You see, tall buildings built in Moscow. Sure, so what? What does it say about the system? They never noticed tall buildings in South Africa because it's a racist regime, all right? Tall buildings in Moscow, that's a different story. Green fields of Soviet collective farms. Yes, it is true. They are green. What do you expect them to be? Red? <laughs> nice girls sunbathing on the, on the Black Sea sh shore, right? There is Black Sea. Yes, there are nice girls. So what? What does it say about the system? They don't explain that only tiniest percentage of population can afford vacation like this. Nice smiling people. Sure they're nice. We pre-selected them. KGB agents like myself. We found these people. We dressed them nicely. We told them what to say to Americans. This is how your journalists end up in Siberia talking to a nicely dressed Eskimo who speaks fluent English and plays a grand piano in the woods. <laughs> And they pretend not to realize that the whole thing is a farce. Here, this is the Mother Russia picture I showed you on the slides. This is the Siberia, right? Here. Not a word about concentration camps, as if they don't exist. And here, it's an interesting parallel. This was published 17 years ago, right? Only last week in South Carolina, Siberian heaven. Would you imagine? This is one of your local newspapers. And who do I see? Boris Yurchenko, Novosti Press Agency photographer. But they don't explain it in your paper that this is KGB plan. They say AP photos. Do you understand what they are doing to you? They plant Soviet propaganda and they say Associated Press picture, Boris Yurchenko. Fortunately, I know who is Yurchenko. Siberian heaven. Well, you may deserve the same heaven if you misbehave. If you allow your media to lie to you people, here, Russian furs, as if you can buy them in Russia, you can buy them here. These furs are being sold to you people for hard currency to get more your technology, to build more rockets to aim at you. This is Russian fashions, as if Russian girls can buy these things. This picture, you don't realize what it is, but I will explain you. Look magazine editors think it's fun, it's photogenic. I think it's filthy, it's tactless, it's brutal to put a cold girl in Russian fur coat on top of Russian Orthodox Church in a country where churches had been dynamited by Communist Party, where priests were lined up against the wall and machine gunned after the revolution, where majority of people are still struggling for religious freedoms. And if some of you are interested in that subject, there is a brochure. We made a movie in Los Angeles. It's called Candle in the Wind, Candle of Faith. Get yourself a free brochure and read what it is. If you're interested, you can contact the people who made this movie. In a country where religious people are still fighting for freedom to, to pray to God, they put a girl on the top of Russian Orthodox Church, probably the only one which is painted nicely to impress people like Billy Graham. <laughs> And if it were one picture, I would say, well, it's a matter of personal opinion. No, the whole magazine is like this. More fashions. You see, they're obsessed with fashions. Russian caviar, champagne, vodka, caviar. Typical Russian breakfast. <laughs> and finally, on some of the last pages, KGB. And you may say, aha, something critical. No, nothing doing. Here, I'll read you the first paragraph. KGB still reaches its tentacles around the world, probing for intelligence, recruiting spies, creating mischief. See? CIA, that's a different story. That's a dangerous bandit. But KGB is simply creating mischief. This is an example. We manipulated 12 American journalists, and this is the result. And believe me, there are hundreds more. Every day, every hour, they lie to you about my system. They lie to you that Russians are your enemies. They never mention that the same system is being introduced right now in your country by the same people who keep in power murderers of my nation. What you call that system is absolutely immaterial. You may call it welfare state, redistribution of wealth, big government, social programming, or scientific planning. It is the same thing. It starts with welfare check. It ends in concentration camps. The moment you delegate your individual freedom and responsibility to a bunch of bureaucrats, whether it is in Moscow or in Washington, D.C., this is the first step to self-destruction. But you don't realize it because you are too excited about Russians coming. When your media tries to explain to you that as long as there are talks between your bureaucrats and Comrade Gorbachev, there will be no war. It's a lie. The war goes on right now. As long as they keep on talking to murderers of my nation, there will be no peace, believe me. This is what happened. 
Now let me briefly, very briefly, do we have another 15 minutes? I'll briefly explain you, because I'm not sure whether you will read my booklet or not. What happens here is that the main objective of Soviet or communist system, including, of course, KGB, is not to destroy United States. Please, I implore you, don't listen to your Pisniks, Frisniks, and Schmizniks. Please use your brains, your good American common sense. If Soviet military destroys United States productive capability. Maybe you'll explain to me, where would they get their computers, technology, grain, billions of dollars of credit, jazz records, blue jeans, whiskey, which Comrade Andropov liked so much? Where would they get all these goodies? Okay, from Australia maybe. The main objective of communist movement is to slowly change the pattern of your society, slowly and painlessly. Meanwhile, they want to preserve your productive capability. If, if they are being reduced, well, maybe it's too bad. But basically, they want to maintain all the juices of your society. It's simply substituting the form of the government and structure of your economical system. That's all. The main objective of Soviet KGB is not to convince you that Marxism-Leninism is better. This type of idiocy appeals only to Martin Luther King's, Jesse Jackson's, and some political science professors. The main objective is slowly, painlessly turn you from an open society, which you are now, and it's open, you can love it or leave it, to a closed society, carbon copy of Soviet socialism. Why? Why would KGB want you to be uh, similar to my society? You ever thought about it? No, of course, because your media doesn't explain it to me. All right, I'll explain it to you. The reason for trying that is to merge into one global system. And you cannot join your society with my society overnight because they are incompatible. They do not match. Imagine if we join together right now for, for the sake of peace, equality, progress, whatever. Tomorrow Ronald Reagan says, my dear fellow Americans, from now on we are one country. You know what will happen? What will happen? Huh? Some Russians may enjoy it. They, they will defect to your country and disappear, as I said, in liquor stores. But you may not enjoy it when you see a tank in your backyard. When your cars will be nationalized and your children put in a military uniform, put in the formation and, you know, I bet you will, you will become very emotional. But it is possible to merge our two societies slowly by introducing this type of system which I described on page 18 in my booklet. And I hope some of you picked up the diagram on the table, which is called subversion process. By mistake it is uh, entitled disinformation process, which is similar, of course. This is what happens. I reproduce this diagram graphically in a condensed abstract form. I do it for simplicity. The reality looks, of course, more complex. But this is the basics. You can write diagrams like this for yourself. All you have to do is to put what you see in chronological order. That's all. I put it this way and I explain it. What I was learning from the Soviet instructors for six years in Moscow. Open society is yours. Closed is mine. We try to turn you into close one to merge, right? They never make any secrets about it. And believe me, some of your elitist groups do the same. They also are talking about interdependent world economy, one world government. If you think I'm crazy, go to library, subscribe to a magazine which is called Foreign Affairs, published by Council on Foreign Relations. Or read the magazine which is entitled Trialogue, published by Trilateral Commission. Read the books by Brzezinski. They openly, cynically, Admit that, yes, their goal is interdependent, one global village, as Carl Sagan calls it. And, of course, they don't explain you that probably millions, billions of people wouldn't mind to live in one world system if it were your system. Believe me, 270 Russians wouldn't mind to live in a free market capitalist system and have a form of government which is a republic, like yours. Sure, they would like to do that. But the trick is, they want one global village, which is ruled by benevolent bureaucrats and scientists, doctors, Kissingers, Jane Fonda's, Daniel Ellsberg's, maybe Walter Mondale's. They will redistribute the wealth by force, naturally, okay? They, le they will legislate equality and all other beautiful things. This is the trick. How to do it? Simple. We don't have to infiltrate agents into your governmental offices, and it is impossible. But we can infiltrate ideas into your minds through your media, through your educational system, through entertainment industry, through music even. Beatles, Schmittles, whoever. We drop by drop put poison into your minds. On this diagram, I select only one such idea, which is called egalitarianism. It is not new. 
It has not been invented by Russians, communists, or KGB. It is as old as mankind itself. No, not as old as mankind itself. Actually, the formulation of this egalitarian idea goes all the way back, I would say, French Revolution, when a group of intellectuals, who call themselves Illuminatis, decided that it is easier to control society if I convince all of you that you are equal. Meanwhile, you, I hope you realize that people are unequal. They never were equal. And God forbid, well, even ever be. Some people are always tall, curly, and dumb. Others are short, bald, and smart. <laughs> There is nothing like equality. If we presume that we are created by God, if God is creator of such complexity as universe, probably wouldn't be a big deal for God to create us all equal, like ball bearings in the factories, or like ants, or cockroaches, or fishes. No! These little forms of life are equal. Mankind is not. Never was. Even fingerprints are different. Ask your policeman. Billions of people populate this planet. No two identical fingerprints. Isn't that interesting? Each one is unequal and unique, and the Illuminati understood it perfectly well. They were inte intelligent people. Why they con invented this nonsense? Simple, to control. It is easier to control people when they are equal and demand equal things. It is impossible to control society if you remain unequal and independently minded. Simple. What egalitarianism does is not just semantic inaccuracy. Listen carefully what it does to you. Egalitarianism, if it is legalized, legislated and enforced by law in your country creates false expectations and false perceptions of reality. We know people are unequal, but by law I must be equal. For equal job, equal pay, right? Why? I say no, it is nonsense. And mean, many of you will disagree with me, especially unionized work. What do you mean, Mr. Schumer? It's the law of our country. For equal pay, equal pay for equal job. Why? Imagine yourself. You do create these things, podiums, all right? You're whistling, you are very happy, you are paid five bucks an hour, fine? You're very happy, sun is shining. The moment you realize that the same podium is created by next door unionized neighbor for 12 bucks an hour, what do you feel? Huh? Unhappy, right? Have you ever heard about any American who wants to be equal with someone who has one popsicle less? <laughs> no, you want to be equal with someone who has more, naturally. Now please explain to a dumb Russian like me, what is behind the equality in the minds of million people? What is the motivation, sentiment? What is the driving force of equality? Huh? What? Greed! Envy and greed! Something that in any civilization, through the history of mankind, in any holy scripture, is described as destructive side of human nature. Don't be greedy, don't envy. If you are happy with five dollars, be happy. You don't need twelve. No, we want to be equal, all right? Greed is the main negative side of human nature. Greed, ignorance, fear, egocentrism, all these things are the breeding ground for communist ideas. Greed. 6,000 years ago, Moses came down from the mountain and says, Thy shall not desire property of thy unionized neighbor. <laughs> huh? No. Well, 2,000 years ago, basically same message from Jesus Christ. Don't be greedy. You are a temporary tenant on this planet. You cannot take all these goodies to um, wherever you go, all right? Now we want to be 20 cents equal. And if we are not paid this 20 cents an hour more, we walk out to strike. If I'm a nurse, I leave patients to die for lousy 20 cents an hour more. If I'm an electrician in New York City, like it happened three years ago, for lousy 30 cents an hour more, I leave city without power, five kids frozen to death, poor children, of course, because rich kids don't freeze, as you know. For lousy 50 cents an hour more, okay, a dollar more. If I'm a truck driver, I shoot another truck driver because he wants to work and I want to bum around, I'm on strike. Are you that cruel? Are you that broke? Do you that desperately in need of 20 cents an hour more? In a super productive nation like yours? You are getting obsessed about these trifles. You are the most generous nation on earth through the 200 years of your history. You are always helping other people. But this is what's screwing up your minds. Egalité, fraternité et liberté. False ideas, artificially created, artificially forcefully introduced by your media, by your public education school. KGB has only to encourage this, that's all. They are not after your secrets. They are after your minds. This is what it does to you. False expectations, when they clash with reality, they create discontent and productivity goes down. Unproductive nation creates 
inflation, unemployment, recession, and many other unpleasant things. Of course, if government prints more money, this is another contributing factor for inflation. Economical problems lead to social unrest, instability, and radicalism, naturally, because people become impatient, they want radical solutions. Radicalism leads to power struggle. Power struggle leads to replacement of the socio-political structure. Through revolution, civil war, or invasion, you're simply being absorbed by a neighboring state like it happens in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. The result, if that pattern goes according to communist plan, is always the same, closed society, just the opposite, carbon copy of my society, now we can merge. This is what any nation can do to itself. This is what you can see on your televisions. This is what you never see on your televisions. On the other side of the diagram, four stages of subversion. Why? So that you will never stop going from open to closed society. Even if you change your mind halfway, if, even if you realize that equality is not important, no, we force you all the way down. How? First stage, demoralization, 20 years, enough number of years to educate one generation of your students exposed to ideas of your enemy. Second stage, destabilization, five years. Third stage, crisis, change of the political structure. And the last one, normalization, that lasts forever. Lifetime of your children, grandchildren, and grand-grandchildren. And that's it. And if you read this diagram carefully, if you're not that stingy to, to buy my booklet for five bucks, you can... You can realize that media occupies only one spec, only one line in this diagram. They are being controlled by the big money. They are following the orders. They are being paid for what they are doing. Not because they are dumb. Well, some of them are ignorant, yes, but not all of them, no. But if you misbehave in a network like ABC, you will be out in two days. If they describe what I am saying to you in positive terms, they will lose their job. This is why they are lying to you. This is why they call you democracy, whereby you are knowing perfectly well that you are a republic. This is why they invent all kinds of garbage, such as dis redistribution of wealth. Forgetting that your president, Abraham Lincoln, said you cannot make poor people happy by robbing the rich, but you can make them happy by allowing them to work and enjoy fruits of their labor. Don't tax them to death, they'll be happy. Don't patronize blacks by giving them welfare checks. Respect them by giving them jobs, by feeling confident, constructive, accentuate the positive. You remember that song? <laughs> These are interrelated things please believe me these things do not happen by themselves nothing happens by themselves except cold or some other unpleasant things political things or social political changes happen in society only if they are planned and intended to happen this is what i'm trying to explain you part of your problem is that you are being manipulated unknowingly and some of your media cooperates willingly or otherwise with subverter this is basically description of the problem as you see it took me almost 90 minutes to describe it and i don't want you to go home depressed i want you to to know the solution and it is so simple you wouldn't believe it it takes only seconds to explain have patience now we will go home where is the solution simple unscientific it doesn't worth eight million dollars it, it, it costs only five bucks you know what is the solution if you don't want to be demoralized by the subverter all you have to do is to stay moral that's all don't change don't rush to social progress bring prayer back to school don't rush after <laughs> try to understand that the demoralization the most heavy the most long process which is incorporated in subversion may become irreversible once you educate majority of your young people they grow up firmly believing that ronald reagan is responsible to clean environment and no he's not responsible to keep uh, defense on the top level no whereby reality is just the opposite ronald reagan is responsible to protect you from outside enemies and if a pentagon wants to a two hundred dollars hammer they must have that toy Ronald Reagan and the federal government is absolutely has no business to clean your air. Look in your own constitution. Process of demoralization. If you don't want to be demoralized and screwed up by your professors of political science who learn, as I showed on the picture from the KGB, all you have to do is to stubbornly abide by the basic moral principles of your society, which are incorporated into your constitution right here. Your basic rights. I don't have to explain you that your, the difference between your society and mine is, is basic. Your rights to live, pursue happiness and be free is granted to you by God. Even if you don't believe in God. All right, suppose you believe firmly that your grandfathers were monkeys. Fine, but isn't it nice to wake up tomorrow morning and know firmly well that your right to live 
is given to you by someone you cannot re-elect. <laughs> it's right here. No, you allow the deceitful idiots of your educational system and your mass media to convince your children that their rights do not come from God at all. They come from nice, smiling politicians, from civil rights movements, from Martin Luther King's, Jesse Jackson's, Walter Mondale's, Geraldine Ferraro's, Ayatollah Khomeini's, Daniel Ortega's, whoever. Like in my country, 66 million people lost their right to leave because that right was given to him by Comrade Stalin, not by God. God doesn't exist. All you have to do to be immune against subversion is to stay moral. Even if you are destabilized, there is a solution. What? If you don't want to be destabilized by the enemy, stop aiding the enemy. Yeah. And how to do that? This is the basic answer, I think. It's, it's common sense, plain common sense. Don't aid your enemy, an enemy of my people. You will instantly make 270 million friends in my country who are sick and tired of the regime which is propped up by your technology and by the billions of dollars in credit. Stop this madness before it's too late. How to do it? The Birches will explain you how. I sold my soul and body to Birches because they've been talking truth for 25 years. Please try to realize that it does not take heroic acts. You don't have to die on barricades or, you know, go into fits of heroism. All you have to do is to exercise your duty as citizens. Watch what your politicians are doing. If you are not happy with the media, subscribe to alternative mass media to broaden up your vision of what's happening in the world. If you subscribe to Time magazine, subscribe to Review of the News. Here, there's a little magazine which is half size of Time magazine. It gives you a hundred times more information. And there is no baloney. But above all, the most supreme value which you can get from the conservative publications like this is that they explain you in concise, simple terms what your elected representative does in, in the Congress. This is where your policy is being made. This is every penny of your budget is being voted for or against. Watch what they're doing. Do they vote for more credits to the Soviet junta? For more weapons to be built in my country to kill more of your boys in Vietnam, in Central America and in Lebanon? Or for less or none? credits to the Soviet junta, then keep them in power. If they vote against lousy 30 million dollars to help Nicaraguans and Salvadorians, this is a treason. Take them out from the office. You will never understand if you read New York Times, you know, 100 pages of all this garbage, what is your representative doing in Congress. But you can, you can know it from this or little paper which is called Trim Bulletin. There's enough reading for two minutes when you go to washroom. Read carefully what your representative is doing. And if you are not happy with what he's doing, call him, send him a letter. 22 cents for a post stamp, that's all. You can do it individually. The best way to do it jointly, by, by joining the ultra-right wing pro-American flag-waving rednecks. <laughs> I have. I, I joined the, the rednecks, I waved the United States flag, and this is the best one I, I ever waved in my life. Now this, this, is, this is all I have to say. I'm very sorry to keep you waiting for so long. I know you have to go places and, and ask questions. If you have questions, I would be happy to be interrogated. If we have short, <laughs> short break and some announcements to make some explanations, then I'll be back and I'll, I'll be ready for any of, uh, of your questions. Thank you very much. We had heard from the folks up the line that uh, Mr. Schumann delivered a riveting performance and he more than exceeded his billing from my perspective. We'll bring him back in a moment for questions and answers, but first, this commercial message. Some of you know Henry Sherman, who is looming over there in the corner. Well, about eight years ago, Henry Sherman ruined my life when he threw a trim bulletin on my lawn. And I never let Henry forget that. But what Henry brought home to me was the fact that I had been a bircher for years and just hadn't realized it. I had heard Larry McDonald speak on many, many occasions, and I always thought he made sense. But on a regular basis, the Atlanta branch of Novosti Press, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, <laughs> would rise up and attempt to smite Larry McDonald. And when I saw that happening, I knew indeed I had found a philosophical home. 
But I'd just like to say, Thomas gave a pitch for the Birch Society that's going to be tough for me to upstage, so I won't endeavor to do so, but I do have some remarks I'd like to make on that connection. All it takes to be a Bircher is character, common sense, and courage to stand for what is right for no other reason than it is right, and the commitment to do the right thing. The right thing is to become a member of the John Birch Society. If you think you can be more effective outside the John Birch Society, take a piece of paper and write down all the things you did last year to return America to her biblical constitutional belief system. If you're like I was eight years ago, you'll wind up with a blank sheet of paper. And I would remind you of a phrase uttered by Larry McDonald in settings like this one. The handles to the oars are inside the boat. Carrying that nautical analogy a step further, as I occasionally ask my fellow Americans for a commitment vis-a-vis -vis the John Birch Society, I'm reminded of the two men out in a rowboat some distance from shore when suddenly a steady leak springs forth from under the forward seat. As the man in the bow begins to bail furiously, the man in the stern simply points to the leak, laughs, and exclaims, Poor fellow, your end of the boat is sinking. <laughs> if you think that's a foolish reaction, I would ask you to deeply consider how you will react to what you've heard here tonight. If we lose America, we will almost assuredly suffer. If you don't think so, come up and ask Thomas Schumann again about life under communism. If, however, you are one of those who has adopted the philosophy embodied in the French phrase après moi les deluges, which translated means let the floods come after I am dead, try to imagine yourself answering a question for your son or daughter. The question, Daddy, what happened to America? Make sure you can say that you did all, and I mean all, you could to prevent the final and ultimate loss of America and the future of your children. We have applications for the John Birch Society at the front of the room, and we'd be pleased to take them after the meeting adjourns. The dues are 48 bucks a year for men and 24 bucks a year for ladies. Yes, we do discriminate. We're going to now have Mr. Schumann return to the podium to answer some questions, and we'll take about 10 minutes for that activity. Is Thomas uh, handy? Where did he get to? Okay. He missed his cue, but we'll forgive him. If you'd please just raise your hand, and we'll recognize you from here. And, and uh, Thomas, if you could repeat the question so we get it on tape. All right. We, we tape and fingerprints, please, too. Yes, go ahead. Well, I don't know how he was manipulated, but I can only guess that he was manipulated the same way as I manipulated journalists from Look Magazine and New York Times and, and television networks. He was given a royal treatment. He was shown the, the glossy side, the facade of, of Soviet uh, churches. There are some churches preserved especially for that purpose. They are painted nicely. They are controlled by the government. And he obviously didn't have enough moral strength to stand up in the middle of Kremlin Palace and say, I denounce the murders of Christians in USSR. He would instantly become a hero in the, in the eyes of millions of my people. He preferred, he preferred to dine and wine with members of Politburo and, and take part in a farce like uh, international uh, you know, gathering like World Council of Churches or something to that matter. And that's a shame. I, I have no excuse for people like this. I thought it was a great disappointment for me because I thought that when I was watching his television broadcast, I said, well, this is a flaming Christian. Obviously, he's not. So that's a great disappointment. But this is only my impressionistic personal viewpoint. I don't know what exactly happened in Moscow. Good. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, you tell me what happened with the aid program, for example, the Aid programs uh, obviously is waste of, of money and, and food and time in case of Ethiopia because it never reaches hungry people, it is controlled. Famine is uh, artificially created. In any Soviet socialist or communist or whatever, people's democracy, there is always the tendency because hunger is the most potent weapon of controlling the society. Even if it doesn't exist, even if such a rich country as Ukraine in, within USSR is unproductive today, it, it, it is not because of bad weather. Uh, aid to Ethiopia now is, is ineffective and it will never be effective. The best way to aid Ethiopians is to kick out Soviet and Cuban troops from Ethiopia. Uh huh. Oh, thank you. Yes, please. Of course they are true dissidents. What else can they be after all they did and wrote and spoke about? Yes, they are. You should read more and listen carefully what they have to say. Any other question? Yes, please. It's not pleasant to think about. You said it took the KGB five years to find you. Yeah. Uh, are you amazed that you've lasted ten more years? 
Uh, well, it, it is a miracle by itself, but on the other hand, I don't think I'm that important. If I were as influential as Larry MacDonald, who was killed by the Soviets over Sakhalin, that would be a different story. Second, it is easier to discredit a person than to kill him. It takes 25 cents for telephone calls to university where I'm employed, and next semester I will not be employed. That's all. And uh, the last reason, I mean reason, not reason, explanation, is that I made my choice. I could have died in Moscow like Chernyenko or Andropov, hated by my people. Or I can die fighting for freedom of my nation and try to help your nation. I think it's more honorable death. We all die sooner or later. <laughs> and more questions? Yes, please. What do you think of the well, it, it sounds quite logical thing to do, to buy stocks of CBS and turn it into a conservative patriotic uh, network, but uh, it depends how they will handle it. Once we acquire all these shares, will they be able to establish sensible network, independent from the big money and, and on all these trilaterals and councils of, on foreign relations and think tanks and stink tanks? This is the trick, because a big network tends to, to expand and bureaucracy, as you know, becomes less and less interested in perfection and uh, accuracy. Like uh, Joseph Pulitzer said, that any newspaper represents a battle for accuracy and, and uh, excellence. Well, big media does not represent any battle at all. They look like bureaucrats, they talk like bureaucrats, they are paid like bureaucrats. Dan Rathers is being paid, what, $100,000 a year or, or more? Naturally, he's not interested in any battle, least of all battle for accuracy. If, if CBS under new control can maintain this independence, fine, I'm with both my hands for this type of... of but believe me, there are more. The, the networks, Christian networks, radio networks, television networks, newspapers, they grow like mushrooms. For the last four years, I've been traveling across the United States. I was amazed to see how public opinion is changing. 76% of Americans are skeptical and unhappy about big media. They create their own media. You should support that media. Don't subscribe, I mean, if you subscribe, fine, but subscribe for conservative uh, alternative as well. And don't support the sponsors, those companies who put their ads in the leftist liberal tabloids and, and big monsters. Don't buy their products. Openly boycott them. I, I don't know, it, it may sound crazy, but... That, <laughs> Yes, please. I don't know. <laughs> I was not an intelligence officer, and I would have no way to know whether he was or was not. But I don't care. I see what he's doing for the last 20 years. He is doing everything to harm United States. He is doing everything to help the enemy. That's all. Take him to court. Charge him with high treason. Together with uh, Armand Hammer, too. Yes, yes, please. Does KGB knows who wants to overfly the Soviet territory? I think they knew because it's it's not a big secret. The list of passengers is not classified information. It, it is very easy to infiltrate any airline office in in the in United States. Uh, whether they did it only because Larry McDonald was there or not, it's it's hard for me to say. But it sounds awfully logical. Yes, to get rid of one anti-communist and influential at that and such a charismatic and beautiful politician like Larry McDonald, sure, they can shoot anything down. And of course, 260 or whatever passengers. They killed 60 million of my people. What do they care about the 200 Koreans? I think they did it on purpose and it's a cold-blooded murder. And I'm ashamed to see that uh, American establishment, George Bush rushed to the funerals of Andropov, but he never attended uh, the, the services, memorial services for Larry McDonald. This is a shame. You should write a letter to Mr. Bush. Pardon? Yes, for a very short time, for, for about six or seven minutes, I had a chance to talk from Seven Club Network. Yes, please? Last question. Well, I don't, it's, it's none of my business to criticize Ronald Reagan. I think if we choose between Ronald Reagan and, and Walter Mondale, Reagan smiles better and he's, he's, he talks more sense. I wish he stopped doing s certain things which, which scare me, absolutely. He gives technology 
and nuclear technology to China, which is a suicide. And it's unreliable partner in the fight against the quote-unquote Russians. It's, it's idiocy. But I don't think that Ronald Reagan does it on his own in, in initiative. He seems to be a very sensible person. He talks a lot of things that make sense. That's why he was re-elected. I think he's being, as, as a chief executive officer, he's being trying to balance between pressure from the Congress, from circles, from elitist groups. And this is what may happen to any person. It's your role to help your president to, to protect your constitution, as he said when he was, you know, inaugurated. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, remind you that uh, the prophet Hosea at 4.6 said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Knowledge is all about you in this room, at the book table over there, where you can get American opinion books. And Mr. Schumann's books are up here. Mr. Schumann's books are up here, so if you'd please... Before we close the meeting, I'd like to call on the Reverend Joseph C. Moorcraft III, pastor of Chalcedon Presbyterian Church, to deliver the benediction. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for our heritage that's full of such rich bounty that you've bestowed upon us. We thank you for our heritage of freedom that we have enjoyed. And we pray that you would forgive us for our neglect of it, for our betrayal of it, that you would grant us deep, thorough repentance that we might recommit ourselves to serve you for the sake of our children and our nation's future. We pray to you who does what he will and no man can stay his hand that you would bring down the Soviet dictatorship. We pray to you who holds the hearts of kings in his hands, that you would change the minds of our national leadership to understand their twofold responsibility of protecting American citizens from Soviet threat and of working to destabilize the Soviet Union all over the world. God bless America, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Good night, God bless you. Drive safely going home. Our founding fathers here in this country brought about the only true revolution that has ever taken place in man's history. Every other revolution simply exchanged one set of rulers for another set of rulers. But only here did that little band of men so advance beyond their time that the world has never seen their like since evolve the idea that you and I have within ourselves the God-given right and the ability to determine our own destiny. But freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Thank you.